us to grasp. So I think it's better that we get form in the first part before moving on. Yeah, the first part of Nectar Devotion is very practical. It deals in the ways and means, the methods, and the different stages of devotional service. Um, see, like I was saying, we have this theory that describes how consciousness will change. And our experience in applying these methods is that it changes in exactly the way that is predicted by this theory. So uh, that's pretty impressive. I don't know anywhere else you can go and find a theory that describes, number one, how to change consciousness, and number two, how consciousness will change precisely upon being influenced in these ways. Huh? It's like going into a laboratory and there's a, uh, a list of procedures. And if you do this and you put this chemical and you heat it to this temperature and then you mix it up like this, you'll get a certain result. Huh? It's like that. Like when you go in the chemistry lab and you mix something. And if you don't follow the instructions, who knows what's going to happen. Kaboom! <laughs> That's why they have everybody wear safety glasses. So um, right now, people are going through life, and they don't have any idea what the effect of their experiences is going to be on their consciousness. Try to understand. If you get in a car, and let's say the controls are wired up backwards, huh? so when you turn the wheel this way, the car goes that way. <laughs> if you don't know, what's going to happen? You're going to have a wreck, right? Drive the car into a pole or a building or something, or hit somebody. So similarly, we have no idea. If we don't have a theory of consciousness, we have no idea what our life is doing to us, what our experiences are doing to us, what the impressions that we absorb every day, huh? what effect they're having on our consciousness. And our consciousness is where we live. Try to understand. Huh? If I'm enjoying, it's because I'm in enjoying consciousness. If I'm happy, it's because I'm in ha my consciousness has the quality of happiness. Huh? If I'm depressed or sad, it's because my consciousness has those qualities. And if I'm suffering, it's because my consciousness, I am conscious of suffering. See? So how do we get into those states? What, what are the different things that cause those states? And how can they be overcome? Well, we know all that. We can, we can give you all that information. We can give you that theory. And then as you go through life, you can understand why your consciousness is changing in certain ways. See? We call this theory the law of karma. The law of karma is very complicated. But it basically has three aspects goodness, passion, and ignorance. Everything you do, everything you see, everything you say, everything you eat, everything you hear, every impression that comes in through your senses is either in the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, or the mode of ignorance. And these impressions will affect your consciousness in absolutely predictable ways. Wait, 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 wait. I'm in the middle of something. Hold on, hold on to your question. So when a person, Krishna explains all this in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13. When a person has an impression or perceives a, a sense impression in the mode of goodness, huh? Let's say he, uh, he drinks some milk. The long-term effect of that impression will be happiness. If someone has an impression, takes in an impression in the mode of passion, let's say he drinks some coffee, 
the long-term result of that impression will be suffering. Huh? He gets ulcers or he gets a heart attack. Or and if someone takes in a, an impression in the mode of ignorance, let's say he has an alcoholic drink, then the result of that impression will be foolishness and suffering and sleep, ignorance. Okay? That's karma. That's karma. Now you multiply the, that impression times a million. And you can understand that the state of consciousness we are in depends precisely upon the quality of the actions. And the problem is that in, most people have no idea what the quality of their actions is. They don't know the difference between the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, and the mode of ignorance. And they certainly don't know about transcendental actions, transcendental experiences, transcendental consciousness. Uh -huh. So they take in all kinds of garbage, not knowing what's what. And then what happens to their consciousness is all mixed up. They're all confused and mixed up, and they don't know which way they're going. They don't know the difference, or the, I should say, they don't know the effects, especially the long-term effects of the different actions, activities that they're performing. So our theory gives those actions and the reactions and the states of consciousness that are produced by all these activities. OK, now you have a question? La pregunta. La gente también está condicionada a extremas modalidades de la. Las personas están condicionadas a extremas modalidades de la naturaleza material. Sí. ¿Cómo adapto mi. Por ejemplo, Hare Krishna, esa modalidad en la noche? Eh. Que si en la noche está bien cantar o sí, cosa. Sí. Pero, ¿Y cómo, cómo afecta? Eh? O sea, las modalidades son tres: la voluntad, la pasión y la ignorancia. Uh -huh, o sea, uh -huh. Cuando yo voy a Krishna y estoy rodeado de gente que, está, que no está eh, conmigo, o sea, que, no, que no es devoto, ¿eso afecta el karma? ¿Afecta la gente de Hare Krishna? ¿Afecta a quién? ¿A ti o a los demás? No, Ah. When, when I was born on my mother's lap in a <laughs> stormy winter night in the year. No. What's the question? When I was, uh, when I chant Hare Krishna uh, and I'm in some of the, one of those modes, what is, what's happening? That's mixed devotional service. Cuando cantas y estás en una modalidad así? Lo que sucede es que estás en un servicio devocional mixto. Yeah. I'm going to get to that later. Voy a llegar a eso en un poquito más. I haven't, I haven't got to that yet. Todavía no llego a eso. Right now we're talking about the effects of the modes of material nature. Now, what happens when a person wants to get out of this material consciousness and develop spiritual consciousness? This is all described in Nectar of Devotion. Uh, first of all, they may encounter some description about spiritual life. And this sounds really, really wonderful. Wow, you get all these ecstasies, and you get free from material suffering, and you're, you're free from material conditioning, and you're just, you can become who you really are, and you have eternal life, and eternal existence in the spiritual world and there's no suffering and everything's beautiful and Krishna's beautiful and it's all very nice. Hmm? So you hear these descriptions and your mind becomes attracted. These are very attractive ideas. Everybody likes these ideas. I mean, is there anybody who uh, likes death? You know, maybe some of these, some of these uh, metal rascals or something like that. But, uh, you know, that they're, they're in ignorance. That's why they have those stupid ideas. 
So uh, anyone who is sane, anyone who is normal in their outlook on life, in their intelligence, they don't want death. They don't want old age. They don't want disease. They don't want suffering. They don't want loneliness. They don't want frustration. They don't want uh, to suffer at all. Uh, I mean, really, I mean, if, I, if you had your choice, you know, between suffering and, and not suffering at all, which one would you pick? Not suffering, of course. Only a madman would choose to suffer. Huh? So then if you know this theory that comes from the Vedas, you would understand that the activities of most people, beginning with their thoughts, are inevitably going to cause them to suffer. Why? Because their thoughts and activities are 